Hello, I'm Pastor Ed Knatzer with Refuge Christian Fellowship Church, and we're continuing our series today on mountaintops. Um, we know that the Lord has, has um, important truths to reveal to us from the scriptures concerning mountaintops. And before we get into this uh, further, let's open up with prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for your Holy Spirit to open our hearts and minds to your word tonight as we, th we thank you, God, for your faithfulness to meet us here. We pray, God, that I would decrease and that you would increase. And Lord, we, do, we desire to learn from you today, and we give you this time. Bless our time in your word, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week, we saw um, how the mountaintops reflect the attributes of God and, and point to the Lord. They help us um, understand God um, and, and get to know him better, just in his, his character and who he is. Then we then we also saw the importance um, as recorded in the Bible how humanity, sinful um, mankind, has taken the hilltops and, and the mountain tops and the high places and and actually used them for worship of idols and demons. And um, and so we know that when Israel uh, God's people went into the promised land. God told them to tear down the high places, and they did not. And so these high places ended up influencing them because they left them there. They did not tear them down. I want to say this going into today's lesson, that the enemy's high places are meant to be our high places of victory. The enemy's high places are meant to be our high places of victory. Just as God destined Israel to, to experience victory over these high places and tearing them down and establishing the worship of God throughout the promised land, but they failed to do so. You know, you and I, in our lives today, um, any, any false things that are exalted in our lives, any sinful places of worship in our lives, those things are destined by God to be your and my places of victory. And then and, and this is a battle. This is why, you know, the, Israel was to go in and fight and take these things and tear them down and, and to know victory in these places. So it is you and I are, are destined for that as in our walk as a follower of Jesus Christ. You know, when you consider Mount Moriah in the Bible, and the, and the truths, the, the history in, in our Christian faith in that, you know, it's first mentioned in Genesis 22, where um, Abraham is goes up to the mountain by the instruction of God. God tells him to go to the specific mountain, and it's Mount Moriah. There, Abraham's going to sacrifice his son to God uh, by the instructions of God. And he's going, and Abraham goes up there to do that. But God, what, what's God do? He provides uh, a ram caught in the thicket, a, a substitute for the sacrifice and worship of God. And um, we know that this is this is symbolic of, of rather than you and I having to die the eternal death before God, we know that God has provided a lamb, and that lamb was Jesus Christ. And he became the sacrifice for our sins, just the way that ram became a sacrifice for Abraham's worship before the Lord. Now, so it's interesting that on this um, on this mountain that you know Abraham calls this mountain the the Lord will provide um, a powerful encounter that Abraham has with God on this mountaintop, the Mount Moriah, and and so this becomes a place where he gets to know God as the as the Lord who provides or who will who will provide. Now, when you about a thousand years later, um, we know that. <coughs> excuse me. We know that that Abraham was was um, promised on and, and on this very location that his descendants, you know, would would cover the world and they would be blessed and by by the Lord. Now we we know also that um, after this. That about a thousand years later, that David actually purchased the threshing floor, the the land right there on Mount Moriah, and um, and his son built, Solomon built an altar there to the Lord after David's death, King David's death. 
But we also know that Solomon's temple was destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar when Israel went back into um, under oppression because of their sin. Um, they, they were allowed to be captured by Nebuchadnezzar. And so the temple was destroyed. <clears throat> now we know that um, that uh, about roughly about 70 years later, the temple was rebuilt. So we know the history all it, the history continues to unfold um, as in, even in AD 70 when the Roman armies uh, marched in and, um, and destroyed the temple. But there, uh, the, there was a wall remaining there. That's the Western Wall today where, where Israel, the people go and pray, <clears throat> pray at this wall and, uh, of what's remaining of the temple. And, you know, the Bible uh, goes on to indicate in Daniel 9.27, that uh, the temple will be rebuilt on, on Mount Moriah, and uh, and all this is setting stage for the, for the return of Jesus Christ. Um, so that you know, it's just exciting to see how just one mountain plays plays a a part in our Christian history. Um, scripture even goes on to say that outside of Jerusalem is the Mount of Olives, and this is where it records in the Book of Acts, uh, Acts one eleven and twelve that this is where Jesus ascended to heaven from. But in Zechariah 14.4, it says that he will return. When Christ returns, he will return and his feet touch the Mount of Olives and it splits open. It splits open. You know, it's interesting to just think of not just Mount Moriah, but the Mount of Olives is symbolic of, of, the, of the ascension of Christ and the return of Jesus Christ. Just, ex just another exciting thing. Uh, area in scripture that points um, to the hope that we have, the hope that we have as followers of Jesus Christ. And we also know that there's the mountain of the Lord. The, Psalm um, 24 asks the question, you know, who shall ascend? The mountain of the Lord. It's the one who has a clean hands and pure heart. And the, the, the Bible, you know, um, goes on to lay out this picture, not only the, do the mountains point and reveal the attributes of God, but we see that they, God is revealed through the stories in the scripture. Um, his character, um, his, and what he, what's the, what's coming in the future for you and I, um, just exciting to see this. And so, so remember when we look at this, these, these mountains and high places are meant to be a part of this story in your life and my life as Christians. Just as Mount Moriah was a place of victory for Abraham, so the mountains that you and I face in life, um, whatever these mountains uh, hold as far as in false worship, things that exist in our lives that shouldn't exist in our lives, things that we, um, we, things that we give place to in our life, sin that we give place to, um, th these things should not be. And God is calling you and I to to tear these high places down so that we can know victory and they can become a part of the witness of what God can do in our lives, just like we've read here in the scriptures. So as we start on tonight, we look at first the uh, prophet Jeremiah. And this is really important because in Jeremiah, he, he lays out the price. Listen, he lays out the price of the disobedience and leaving these places of vital worship and actually becoming a partaker of the worship of these sinful practices. Um, and then, but then there's a promise in there as well. We're going to look at this because this is really important. You know, a lot of times you know, we saw last week how uh, when we give, we, we don't do what God told us to do. We leave these things in our lives and we do not remove them. They not only affect us, but they, they just, affect and destroy our families and our children. And and so when you know, a lot of us can look back and with regret and sorrow and great remorse over what we have done to our families and how we have affected even our own children by the sin we've allowed in our own lives. And and so this that you know I want to say that that we we need to feel that that sorrow and that sadness and remorse and that grieving of the Holy Spirit in us. It's a part of the thing that, that we grow to, um, and we learn to hate the sin that's caused this. And, and, and we want to change. We, we want to be somebody different and we don't want to go backward. We want to go forward in Christ. And so, 
So we have the prophet Jeremiah here. Now we're going to pick up with Jeremiah 32. And he says, for the children of Israel, this is God speaking, for the children of Israel have provoked me only to anger with what? The work of their hands, says the Lord. So they were laboring in their life. And, and the labor they were doing was, wasn't for the Lord, but it was for the idols. It was for the sin. And it was to serve the sin that they had given themselves over to. And so in, in uh, 32, 32, it says, For this city has been to me a provocation of my anger and my fury from the day they built it, even to this day. So I will remove it from before my face because of all the evil of the children of Israel and the children of Judah, which they have done to provoke me to my anger. Um, you know, it's so important that you and I um, understand that that, um, that that the choices we make and and the thing we bow to in our lives, that the things that God calls sin and he calls us to flee from them, if we don't flee from those things, but rather run to them and partake in them, this, this is something that God disciplines and corrects, and he will not allow it to go on. So we find here in 33 and 34, and they, and they have turned to me the back. Or in other words, he's saying that, listen, they're not looking, these people are not looking to me. Uh, they're not putting their face to me to seek me and find me, but they've turned their back to me. And, and, and he says, and not the face, though I taught them. And so this is really important. God is teaching you and I in the word that these mountains are to not, we're not to partake in them. We're to, but we're to tear down these high places. And the, and, but, but when we don't do that, it's like turning our back to God and not our face. And he says, even though he's taught us what to do, we turn our back to him. He says, listen, he goes on to say, rising up early and teaching them, yet they have not listened to receive instruction, but they set their abominations in the house, which is called by my name to defile it. You know, I want to say that one of the things that happens is that if we, if we go to these high places and to partake in the sin, it's just a matter of time before we bring that back into the, the temple of the Lord. And, it, and, it's, and then it becomes a part of our place of worship. It says here, And they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire to Molech, which I did not command them. So what, what Israel had gotten so far off that they actually built their, they began building their own places, high places of worship, to the, to the idol, the wicked God of Moloch, and they were sacrificing their children to them. It's hard to imagine, um, it's hard to imagine that people, God's people could get to this point, but it, 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 ha it happens, it happened then, it has happened today. And so you and I need to flee these sins, these sinful high places in, in our world, in our society, the things that society is lifting up and exalting and telling you and I it's okay to, to be partake in that. It, it, and it's, it's not, uh, there's nothing wrong with it. Or, and and uh, it's, God's not really angry with those things. All that's a lie. You know, all the, the sin of pride the, and the sin of lust and the sin of the love of money and the, and all the, the love of self, um, you know, all these sins in our land today, um, it, it's all grieves and, and, and brings the, the correction of God. Uh, it's bringing the correction of God upon our nation now. And, um, and, and, and so we need to repent and individually as followers of Christ and flee these things. As we look on, it's in verse 36 and 37. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning this city of which you say it shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. So in other words, people were looking at the correction of God on his people, and they were saying, oh, this is it. It's done. It's over for them. It's going to be delivered now into the judgment and, and they're going to be wiped out. 
And you know, there, God wants you to know today that if you have given yourself over to sin, you need to repent and come back to him. He's calling you back to him, uh, but it's time to flee the sin. Um, it, we need to wake up and hear this and flee sin and, and to get back where we need to be with the Lord. There's no time left. This is the day and the hour to to deal and do business with God and make things right. And so he's calling for repentance among his people. And what's it? And, and so it says here, verse 37, he reveals a promise. Listen, this is to those after correction is done and after he's done dealing with the sin of the people, he, it, it looks like it's over. It looks like it's done. But God wants you to hear this hope today. If you will repent and turn from your sin, then if the we, if I, if the church, if we do this, listen to what God says. This is really important. Verse 37, behold, I will gather them out of all the countries where I've driven them in my anger, in my fury, and in great wrath. Listen, we've seen God do that with the nation of Israel. He's brought them back after they were scattered. He's brought them back to the land of Israel. Listen, there is a promise for you, for anyone who repents and turns from their sin. The Lord says he's going to bring you back. There's a promise that here it is of restoration. And so we see this here. Um, and and, and after, after God has dealt with them, drove them out in great wrath because of the sin that they had done, he says in verse 37 to 39, I will bring them back to this place and I will cause them to dwell safely. So listen, so even though, even though they've been the people of God in the old Testament had been corrected by God, lost their place in, in the land where they lived and were under God's correction. He says, I will bring them back to this place. Listen, and I will cause them to dwell safely. God's going to work. If you, if you, if I, if the church will repent of its sin, God will move and call, bring us back to a place where we, we dwell safely. Now, listen, there is an oppression coming upon the church in the U.S. As it's going to be a discipline and correction, but it's going to be under that oppression. There's going to be revival will be birthed. And it's out of that revival there will be repentance, and out of that repentance will come the restoration that we're reading about here. Just as promised was is to Israel, I believe is promised to you and I. And so it goes on to say that cause them, He will cause you and I to dwell in safe to dwell safely. What's the scripture say? Though a thousand fall at thy right, ten thousand no evil shall befall thee. Who's that talking to? Well, it's not talking to the it's not talking to the, the child of God who's out there living in sin. It's talking to the one who's repented and who's turned and heading away from sin, walking away from it and pursuing the Lord um, to, and pursuing getting right things right with God. Verse 38, they shall be my people. I will be their God. Verse 39, then I will give them, here it is, one heart and one way that they may fear me forever. He says there he's going to do such a work in the heart of Israel that, that they're going to fear him forever. In other words, it's going to be an everlasting change he's going to bring into their hearts. You know, that's what's true for you and I. When we repent and go to God, he brings everlasting change inside our hearts. It says, why, why does he do that? That they may fear me forever. Listen, for the good of um, for the good of them and their children after them. In other words, he, he, he brings an understanding to his, to his children that, that is for the good. It's for their good and it's for the good of their kids. This is why we need to turn from sin and tear down these high places that are being, um, raised up, um, in this land that we live today and promoted to you and I as being okay to be a, to partake in, but we should not. We, we, we should not be doing that. In Jeremiah 32, 40, 41, it says, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away 
from doing them good. Listen, this is a listen to this covenant that God is telling. He's going to do this for Israel, his people. And this is also reflective of you and I today. And so he says, listen, that I will not turn away from doing them good. What a covenant, what a promise that God's going to bring an everlasting change in the hearts of his people after correction is completed. And when there's repentance is revealed in our hearts, he brings this into our lives. I don't know. Listen, this is, again, we see the, the importance of, of not wasting time and getting back and getting right with the Lord. So it says here, but I will put my, God says, I will put my fear in their hearts so that they, what, will not depart from me. That this is, this is the keeping power of God is the fear of the Lord. And so that we don't depart from him. And so, um, and, and listen, when you, when he puts that fear in us, it's something we learn, we grow in, and it grows greater and greater as, as we, um, learn obedience before the Lord in our lives. The fear of the Lord grows greater and greater within us. He says here, yes, I will rejoice over them to do them good. And, and I will assuredly plant them in this land with all my heart and with all my soul. God is saying with all who he is, he is going to bring this about for his people, his chosen ones, the ones who hear his voice to turn and repent, the ones who hear his voice to begin tearing down these high places rather than letting them exist and being a part of them. Listen, it's time for you and I to seek the Lord and to ask him to give us wisdom and discernment over what he wants us to tear down and what he wants us to get rid of in, in our lives. In the, in Jeremiah 42 says, For thus says the Lord, just as I have brought all this great calamity on this people, and that's the correction of the Lord, so I will bring on them all the good that I have promised them. And this is, a, this is an amazing picture of the grace and the mercy of God um, and dealing with his children. And you and I, this should be a strength and an encouragement to you and I, and it should be a motivator within us that if there is sin that we have not, we are still involved in, we need to repent and get, get or get rid of it. And because listen, it's, it's, it's bringing the correction of God into your life and my life. And as he said here, all this great calamity. You know, God's discipline and correction can involve a great calamity in the lives of his children if they don't repent. So this is really important that we hear this clearly. We are not to be partaking in the high sinful places of worship in this world today any longer. We are to be actively tearing them down. And you say, well, what does that mean um, that we tear those things down? Well, the scripture goes on to show us what that means. And I want to talk about our high places as we um, just begin to touch on this a little bit first. Paul teaches us, and let's listen to what he teaches us. He says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. So Paul's saying even though I have a physical body and I live daily in this physical body and I, and I deal with things, I, you know, we deal with temptations and, and we deal with the, the lust of the flesh, the, yes, the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life. And, and we also deal with the world, the flesh and the devil. Um, all these things we deal with, even though we're in the flesh, he says, we do not war. The word war means to fight. Or engage in we don't we don't stand in opposition or war against these things according to the flesh. In other words, we're not going to win if we if we're just settled in in our own natural self to think we're going to be determined enough the next time to say no to temptation 
or something like that. But it says here, for the weapons, verse 4, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. In other words, they're not fleshly. He says, but mighty in God or through God for the pulling down of strongholds. Now, the strongholds are in a spiritual realm. These strongholds uh, can exist in our society and they can even exist within us if we give them place. But he says here, the weapons of our warfare, they're not a physical weapon according to our flesh, but the weapons we have are mighty through God to the pulling down of these strongholds. And so whether, like we said, whether in society or even within ourselves, these things can come down. Now the term stronghold here is a military term, but it, it doesn't matter. It's this scripture reveals that these things can come down. You and I need to begin to believe and speak and understand that these mountains of demonic worship in our land, these high places, um, these strongholds can come down in the name of Jesus. And so let's go on and look further at what Paul reveals. He says, and, th and this is what he says, it's the pulling down of strongholds, and then he builds on that, and casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So here you have, um, it's the pulling down of strongholds and casting down arguments. So you get the idea that that this uh, this stronghold is built on an argument that is lifted up in our thinking and in our values. Listen, this is an argument that a lot of times that either we can believe a lie of the enemy, but it's a, it's a it's a thought. It's a it's an argument within us that we we are we receive an argument of the devil against doing what God wants us to do and defending the wrong we're doing. And and so this is a casting down the weapons that God's given you and I in the spirit, um, which are, we can, our praise is a weapon. The word of God is a weapon. Prayer is a weapon. Obedience and yielded surrender to the word is a weapon. All these things are powerful. The gifts of the spirit um, are the gift of tongues and these things. These are all weapons fasting is a gift, is a weapon. You know, all of these things are important um, in bringing down the strongholds and tearing down these spiritual high places of false worship and sinful living. These things can come down. This, this here in Corinthians is teaching us these things can come down. And so it's a casting down of arguments. And then, and then it goes to say, and every high thing. Now, this is, a, I believe, in the wording here, this is also a reference to value um, and desire and value. What we desire and value, it, we, it's lifted up within us, and, and it, it exalts itself. It exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And this could be anything. All kinds of stuff can come into life, into your life and my life, into our thinking and can, be, can become, they can be protected by the arguments we have in us. Why? Because somewhere we're lifting up something, it, whether it's sinful behavior um, or, or whether it's a, a, an object or, or person or, or it's something that we're exalting. And it, whatever it is, it's exalting itself against the knowledge of God in our lives that we know that God alone is worthy of our worship and we should fear him and obey him. But whatever this thing is in us, and it could be different, it's different for all of us, but it exalts itself against the knowledge we have of God and, and opposes it. And, and we yield to it in opposition to what we know the word of God says, and all of us have it. This is why the scripture says, let us lay aside every weight and every sin that so easily besets us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. We're, we are to consider him and consider what he endured, lest, lest we grow weary and faint and lose heart. 
the scripture says. Well, this, the knowledge we have of God, when we focus on the Lord, we have the upper hand. We, you have the spiritual upper hand to take down and begin to dismantle and pull down these strongholds, these high places, um, these mountaintops of demonic worship that are being exalted in our society. Um, it says here, listen, it exalt these, so these high, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, listen to what it says, bringing every thought into captivity, bringing every thought into captivity, what? To the obedience of Christ, to the obedience to Jesus, and being ready to punish all disobedience when our obedience is fulfilled. So, so listen, we want, there's a, there becomes a desire within us to be an obedient children, to obey our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, so th what this scripture is telling us, Paul's teaching us, that it is possible to tear down these high places, amen? It's possible to see these things brought down and defeated in the name of Jesus. Listen, the Lord wants you to take hope today. There's a promise. There's a promise that even though if you're, if you, I believe the church is going to go under discipline and correction here in the U.S., um, but even in that place, God says, I'm going to restore. You all, even though whatever that measure of correction is, he said, but I'm also, I'm going to bring all the good that I promised. It's so important you and I know this and we focus on the Christ and we respond to God and lay aside every weight and every sin and to pull down these strongholds and to tear down these high places. We do not want to be like Israel was and let these things exist because they capture and influence us and capture our hearts over time and take us away from the Lord. We, we don't want that. I don't want that. And I know you don't. So let's, let, let's pray today that the Lord would do a work in our hearts as we yield to him to leave these sinful places behind, not just leave them, but then we want to play an active role in our lives and seeing these things tear, torn down. And we do it. We do it through the weapons that God has given us in, in our lives spiritually. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you today, Lord, to strengthen us and encourage us, Lord. We ask you to forgive us, Father, to running to the sinful things that this world does. Father, for, for um, entertaining these things in our hearts that the world exalts as being okay and, and says there's nothing wrong with it. But yet, God, it's sinful in your eyes and it's an abomination to you. So many things, God. Help us, Lord, to see these things for what they really are and to repent, God. We, Lord, we ask you, God, for a new heart today that we could turn away, not just turn and flee, but, God, we want to tear down these high places in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, you said, you told us today here in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Lord, that these weapons of our warfare, they're not like a, a, a gun or a knife or something, but they're spiritually powerful through you, God. And they can pull down strongholds and every every high argument can cast it down. And, and Lord, that, that you, you, Lord, can bring down every high thing that exalts itself against you in our thinking, in our hearts, in our desires. Father, we ask you, Lord, today, Lord, may your Holy Spirit come into our lives and tear down these high places. God, help us, Lord, in doing that. Help us to be active in seeing and playing a part in, in our tearing these things down within our own lives. Lord, some of us have been building things we shouldn't be building in our lives. We repent of that. Lord, help us to tear these things down today. Lord, so we repent today of these sinful idols that are raised up in our in our nation. Um, Lord, the love of money, the greed, and the Father, the love of self, the Father, the lust, and, and, the, and the sin of murder, and God, all of these things that are just really revolved around, around pleasure, pleasing us, Lord. We understand your word says in the end times men will become lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. We don't want to be that, Lord. Lord, we don't want to be that. We yield to you today and cry out, God, for your hand of revival in our lives. 
Lord, for we repent and we turn from the sins of this land. And Father, we run to you today. We run to you today. Lord, we, we, we are excited, God, of what you are speaking to us here. And Father, so we thank you for, the, for these mountains of wickedness and sinfulness are destined to be our mountains of victory. And we thank you for that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Will you have a, a blessed week? We'll see you next week.